So I'm uh, the creative lead uh, in the digital customer experience team at ANZ, a bank in Australia. We also have some of our uh, designers working in Bangalore, so it's great for me to get to hang out with them while I'm here. So kudos to you guys. Hi. Um, so, oh gosh, that's better. Um, so I, I've got a lot to get through today and <laughs> not a lot of time, so I'm just going to jump straight into things. And open up my talk. Okay, great. So, so basically what I'd like to talk about today is how designing, making, creating from the heart, from a place where you feel something for someone else, is really powerful and can help you innovate uh, in, your, in your worlds and help you fill out the full picture. So I know we've heard a lot from a lot of amazing speakers over the last few days, and one, one of the big themes that I've picked up on is something that's really key to me and something that I really want to focus on, and I think that's what we all understand to be the most important part of user experience, and that is... And next, <laughs> the drama. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll get this guy. People, yay. <laughs> so people are really the most important thing because that's who we're designing for. That's why we do what we do. We don't really do it for a lot of other reasons if, if we're doing it for the right reasons and we're doing it from our heart. So what's really important is to understand people and to understand them not just at a shallow level but to understand them at a deep level because we're more than just like one-dimensional creatures. We're very complex. And for those of you who were in uh, my workshop yesterday, understand that I got you to dig pretty deep <laughs> and uh, to almost a confronting place before um, you could get to, get to know each other on that kind of level. So people are a lot. They're a lot of things. They're all these things. They're inspired, hopeful, desperate, dissatisfied, complex, and amazing at the same time. And, and how I like to think of that is that they're actually whole people not just one-dimensional people. And the thing that's important about understanding how to design for whole people is that we're designing for whole experiences at the same time, and that's really what we design for. So how do we understand people holistically? So I'm proposing today that empathy is the key to understanding people holistically because it's a way that we can understand them in multiple levels. So what I'm going to let you experience is what I believe can, what I believe empathy can do, which is to help you, to help your practice, to help your products, to help your users, your business, your organizations, and your societies, and possibly the world. So empathy occurs, as um, Simon Baron Cohen said, empathy occurs when we suspend our single-minded focus. Um, and attention and adopt a double-minded focus of attention. And what that means, those of you in my workshop yesterday will have heard this before, but what that means is that we're designing for two types of empathy, not just a single type of empathy. And there are, there are some differences between the two. So cognitive empathy is what we generally use, and that's the kind of empathy where we can understand how someone else is thinking and feeling, because we've probably been in a similar situation or We've, we've felt that way one time before. So we can understand that cognitively. Emotional empathy is actually when you, you feel what someone else is feeling. It's a very different thing, and together they complete the picture of empathy. So here's a bit about the brain. I am no like cognitive scientist, so this is an abstracted and very simplified version of how the brain works, but there are three parts of the brain. There's the reptilian brain that controls like our heart, our breathing, all that sort of stuff. It's actually where fear is stored as well, which is kind of interesting. Then there's the neocortex, and that's what separates us from a lot of the animal kingdom. They have like quite thin neocortexes, where ours is really, really thick. And this is our analytical thinking, our ability to like abstract thought, use symbolism, um, remember languages, all that kind of stuff that sets us apart. But then what we share with the rest of the animal kingdom is our limbic system, and that's the part of our brain that has our memory, and it's a mixture of a lot of, uh, a lot of chemical processes, and uh, it also stores our empathy, our base empathy. So lots of animals feel this kind of empathy too. <laughs> so 
what we need to understand is that we're ma merging these two types of empathy together to understand a whole person and to be the most effective. So in terms of what, what we use cognitive empathy to do, that's to create maps. We're very good at creating maps, <coughs> abstracting things in a way that can help us understand things more holistically and better design for them. And the kinds of designs that result from understanding things in these levels are very logical and very sensible and very usable and, and probably really great designs. We use empathy maps, we understand emotions in lots of ways, and people try to just make meaning and understand the world in these ways. So this is how we normally work, but emotional empathy is more about understanding the territory. So you've got your map and then you've got your actual territory, which is the world that you actually experience. So that's different. So just for a few seconds, let's look at these people and see how they're feeling. Do you feel a bit more connected to them than they did the maps, emotionally, possibly? Obviously, they're just photos, but they're, they're, that's what connecting deeply and empathically on that emotional level is all about. So now I'd like to have a little look at, back to cognitive empathy and, and what motivates people, because understanding what motivates people is a way for us to, to really understand them at a deep level. So we can use our cognitive empathy to understand people at a, a shallow level, but it's really important to get deep to really understand. So according to self-determination theory, there are lots of theories, but this one's an interesting one, um, we're motivated to feel pretty much two things, well-being and a sense of thriving. Thus our ambition to do well at work, uh, our, all of our focus on you know, feeling good in our lives and feeling like we're actually thriving and working well. So there are three aspects to that. There are the psychological needs, and I won't go into this list, but this is, um, this is a list that's been put together by um, a number of researchers, uh, Sheldon is one, and what's interesting is over the last 15 years of the research, those top three things consistently stay in the top three positions. Because some reason, we're really motivated psychologically to be autonomous and be authentic, to be related to and connected with others, and to be competent and, and effective. The others are really important as well, um, but they're really key, really, really, three really key ones. So the other thing that's tied to motivation are our values and our goals, basically how we see the world, what we value. And we're motivated by personal, intrinsic goals and values, and these are things like personal growth, love, helping others, etc. And we're also motivated by extrinsic goals, so what our society puts upon us, like uh, affluence, beauty, status, power, etc. And we're also motivated to behave in a certain way, to feel how it feels to, to behave in a certain way because it's enjoyable or interesting um, or that it reinforces our sense of selves. And we're also motivated in, uh, by our society to behave in a certain way and that's often guilt or fear or pressure or wanting to please other people. So we're motivated by all these things as well. So the way that I see it um, is that these are the sorts of things that we need to consider when we're trying to understand someone at a deep level and trying to understand what motivates them. And if we understand those as a framework, we can then build on that by understanding how those universals can then vary and be specific to people when we move into thinking about them as an individual and thinking about how they're affected by their society and their culture and how they're affected by the situation that they're in. How does that change things? So I consider this to be the whole person. When we're thinking about someone at multiple levels, we think about them at, this, at these levels. And we don't just think about them, we put ourselves in situations where we can understand these things and be exposed to their perspectives on these things so we can feel them as well. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that we should move away from thinking about just designing user experiences to designing human experiences. Because we're not just users, we're more than that. We're, we're more than just users even when we're using a product. So raising our perspective up and changing our perspective is going to help us understand and op more opportunities in how things work. So how can empathy power innovation? 
So there's a lot changing in the world, and I've picked two theories that exemplify this, and some other people have mentioned them uh, over the last three days, so I think it's a good kind of follow-up on that. <laughs> so there are two theories that uh, expose different ways for us working, to work in the world and different, different ways for us to value things. So let's look at what we value first. So a number of people have spoken about the experience economy, and so you probably have a fair idea about what this is, but what's interesting about this is that this is now about what we value as, as societies. And so we're starting to value experiences much more. But what's even more interesting is that we're actually starting to value the transformation that experience can give us even more. So we're looking for things to change us, to, to make us better people, to, to give us a sense of growth and progress. And um, Pine and Gilmore, who developed this theory, they say that businesses must orchestrate memorable events for their customers and that memory itself becomes the product. The experience offer is transformation. And um, Brian Chesney, Airbnb CEO, said that he echoes this in saying that he would much prefer to build something that 100 people love. So that's that transformative, like rich, deep appreciation of something rather than you know, something that a million people kind of like. And even Airbnb is actually putting that out into the world now. So they've developed uh, a whole new side to their business where they're actually selling experiences. So you can have an experience that someone else is going to give you. So it's, it's a clear indication this is a direction we're heading in. Um, and John Kolko said in his recent book on empathy that modern startups like Airbnb and Nest have proven that industry disruption is possible not by adding features or getting people to buy more, but by focusing instead on providing deep, meaningful engagement um, to people who use these products and services. So empathy is important in this context because it's a natural way that someone, that we can understand someone well enough to be able to understand what could be transformative to them. So let's look at how we work and the changes there. So this is the conceptual age. So this is uh, a theory introduced by Daniel Pink in a whole new, whole new world in uh, 2005. Again, echoing the same transformation in our society as we move from agricultural to industrial to information age and now into conceptual age. And what's interesting about this and, and about how this affects how we work is that it produces office spaces like this, uh, places that are much more aligned to supporting these kinds of goals uh, in the way that we work. So society and businesses are now valuing design a lot more, valuing story, valuing symphony, empathy, play, and meaning. Oh, wait, can we take some photos? <laughs> um, so how we work and what we value is essentially transforming this creative, empathic people, creating transformative experiences. So that's like this new world that we're kind of heading into. So, Let's innovate to support not only what's useful, but what's also valuable and meaningful to people in this new age. Um, and I think it's actually time for us in UX, because over the last 20 odd years, we've done pretty amazing work understanding how to build patterns um, that are great for cognition, really fast uh, for task completion. Um, they enable us to, to understand how people think and how people um, digest information really well. So I think we've done so much on that level that it's now time for us to add this additional dimension into our work. So how? So basically, use empathy to empower you, empower yourselves. To create better designs, as I said before, to create richer and more holistic human experiences, better business outcomes too. It actually like adds up in the end, and more caring and empowered organizations and societies. So let's start with you. So there are five key reasons, I think, that you should use empathy. There are probably more, so like shout them out if you can <laughs> think of them. Um, empathy sur surfaces latent needs, so having empathy for someone allows you to see them in a different way and see aspects of them, or the process that you use to gain empathy can help you understand what they really need maybe even beyond what they say they need. Um, and it's deep. It's going to be like something you can really connect with on a deep level and feel more fulfilled by understanding. And it'll make you care more, because basically if you 
understand someone and empathize with them, you'll care more. And, uh, oh, sorry. And it'll lead to intuition. You'll be able to work out what's the best for them. And it'll make you nimble. So Steve Jobs and um, Aiko Morita of Sony didn't do much market research when they were in, in their roles, but they instead did a lot of walking around <coughs> watching people, putting themselves in other people's shoes. Because at the end of the day, you need to espouse this feeling that comes from your gut. It's about people connecting with you on that level. So I pulled this together about looking for, deep, for empathy at different depths. So you can get empathy at all these levels, but certain activities are going to get you deeper empathy than other activities. So it's really important. All this stuff's important. Behavioral data, super important. Demographics, super important. Because you can see how people are behaving and how people are behaving in, in groups, smaller groups. Um, personas are great because they help you, you know, aggregate a lot of people into a single outlook. Um, design testing, usability testing, etc., is fantastic. Very task focused and uh, and design focused, but it's really great. But then the final four, which are contextual inquiry, listening to stories, co-designing, etc., there are more in this category. But these ones are the ones that are going to build that more emotional empathy because they're the ones that are going to connect you with actual people. So if you connect with actual people, you're going to start building that empathy. So. There are really, as I see it, sort of five key ways to gain empathy. There are stories, observation, discussions and conversations, visual response, and co-design. And I, I won't go into much detail. If you want any more detail, I've got some slides on, on this in detail. But in the uh, interest of time, I'll skip past this. But, but this is a really Im Im five important ways that you can gain empathy for people. So one way I do want to share with you today is a way that um, I uh, it's a project that I worked on for my master's thesis about five years ago. I thought it'd be cool to show some other work, but um, a lot of that is under NDA, so I can't really show you that stuff. So this is on me, so I can show you this stuff. <laughs> and um, to echo some of the sentiments earlier around showing case studies, here's a case study. So what I did was um, I designed for, I was very curious about understanding how to design for emotional richness and depth. Um, so instead of designing for a lot of people, I thought, well, what, what's it going to be like to design for just a few people and see, see what happens there? So I designed for museums, uh, learning experiences in museums on mobile phones. And meet Alice. So Alice is one of my generous participants who gave me her time. And to thank her for giving me her time, I produced a, I designed for her a, a beautiful kit. Uh, I called it an insights kit. It's essentially like a stimulus, stimuli kit. Uh, and I produced this for her and sent it. I was in New York, she was in Australia, and she spent two weeks completing it before sending it back to me. But it was designed in a very specific way to get sort of rich, deep, meaningful content that's kind of holistic. So how it was designed was to, to get her sense of self, her feelings, her experiences, her opinions, uh, and her emotions. So the first thing was um, what I called an album, and it was essentially like a, a biography of her. So I asked her to tell me about herself. So those of you in my workshop would have gone through this yesterday, <laughs> a shortened version of this, uh, where she, she was able to express herself in her own natural way. So some people did collage, montage. They put tickets that they had captured in there, and they, they created these very rich and um, visual like uh, responses to, to this activity. The next activity was... A diary. So this was where she documented her life for those two weeks. So like a diary study, very similar, but in a very tactile way. And the third thing were a series of postcards that had very specific questions on them tied to the specific context that we were working in, so tied to learning uh, so, and tied to, um, to mobile technology and gameplay and... Uh, things that were really important to her. So I asked her things like, you know, tell me a story that's changed your life. Uh, how do you learn and what's most, your most valuable skill, etc. And I also asked for themes, uh, emotional themes, uh, cultural themes, uh, and a number of other themes that could tell me a bit more about what she believed in, what her values were. Uh, 
And then I said, here's a notebook. So when you go to the museum, I asked them all to go to the museum for me and have an experience and record it. Um, so when she went to the museum, I said, any ideas you have or any ideas you have after you go, just jot them down, put them on this in this notebook and send them back. So she went to the museum and used the iPod Touch that I also included. And she went there and recorded everything, photos, videos, etc. Um, and then any time she felt anything, she could use an emotion sticker to stick on something. So I, I can't really show you all of the stuff because I, I, I said that I'd keep it private, but it was amazing. It was incredible to get immersed in this to try to understand someone better. And it was a, doing it remotely was definitely a, an interesting experience as well. So then we like connected and talked about ideas and I transcribed the ideas and noticed a lot about her values and a lot about what mattered in her life. And then summarized them and came up with uh, a proposal. We, we worked on it together and we decided that she was going to focus on memories in museums and how, how to build memories and store them. And then how to share those memories and how to, how to deal with kind of virtual objects and, um, and physical objects. So I did some sketching, came up with some ideas, shared them with her. We decided to move in a certain direction. And then I finally created a design and shared that with her and put it together and proposed it to her. And then that was really the end of the experience. But more than the design or the process, what was really important was what I learned when I heard back from these people and what I learned from understanding what they felt in total. So she felt she had a greater connection to all these histories in her environment. She felt she had a greater connection with what's on an, a pedestal in an exhibition and what's hidden, hidden in the vaults because it pulled up a lot of the archival stuff. And she just loved, loved it. So she said she loved it. And that was an amazing thing to hear back from someone. And that's essentially what we're aiming for with our designs. So when I look at products and how we can innovate products, Having, creating a product that has a personality or even a soul and making it more like a friend is incredibly valuable to people. And you might think that this doesn't make sense for you know, software in a business place, but it does because we're all humans and we all want to feel a certain way and we all want to connect with people. So I did that process for three people and created three different applications. And for Alice, Lexi and Sarah. What was interesting about that is that they all actually had the same features and functions. They were all the same. Strangely enough, they all kind of wanted to do the same sort of stuff. And so this is what we probably would aggregate from doing a lot of research for people. But what was interesting is even though they wanted to capture objects, navigate and orient, filter, read information, share with and hear from other people. They all wanted to do these same things. And none of them wanted the, the mobile device to be the entire experience. They all wanted it to be an augmented experience on top of going to a museum. But what was so interesting is that what I realized is that going through that process with individuals, it gave me a, the awareness that the design, that the application had to have a purpose. It had to be built around something that was meaningful to these people. And it had to have emotional and cultural value to these people. It had to have a viewpoint and a character. And that viewpoint and character came out through the process of me getting to know these people better, which was an amazing experience. So they all had the same features. They had a few additional features that supported the, the concept. But the key purpose behind each of these was different. So behind the, um, the application threads for, for Alice, it was about learning that we are responsible for preserving our culture. And then the design for Sarah was, oh, for Lexi, sorry, was learning that we are all more connected than we may think. And the design for Sarah was to remind ourselves how important and rewarding giving can be. And I don't have time to explain how these were set up, but, um, but I can definitely chat with you later if you're interested. So that was, that was a process that led to an understanding of richer and, and more holistic human experiences through design. And obviously, you're probably saying, well, how can we do that? You know, we have to <laughs> like design certain products. But I think there is potential to, to go through a process like that and start to see how uh, the group of people as, as a larger group 
whether their values are similar and whether you can actually align to a certain larger societal group of values and, and then try to infuse those, that purpose, that character and that cultural meaning into the designs. So the other thing about um, empathy is that the more you know what's about, the more you know about people, the more you feel about people is the more, the less experience waste you'll be creating because we can create a lot of waste uh, just by having stuff out there that's not actually that valuable to people or there are processes that are just, you know, maybe too complicated or you're forced into having to do. But think about, you know, anticipatory design, it's a new thing coming up and how you can be relevant to people, don't waste their time. And how you can be resonant to people, make, you know, give them a sense that it's tied to them and it's it meaningful to them and that it's emotive and that it's you know, tied to their values and that it's meaningful to them. So make more empathic human connections by focusing on human problems leading to human value outcomes. And the more you focus on the human problems, the more your designs will be contain human value outcomes um, and the more you'll think in a different way about them. So the other thing is I said in all contexts, so with the workplace changing, we can even think about how designing software that's very task oriented might be too closed a focus. Why don't we open the focus up and think about maybe how the software could change to integrate with a new way of working. So how about we work with companies to try to understand that, that level of human experience as well. So how can, how can empathy help your business? Well, it can help your business based on one really true, <laughs> true fact is that people are willing to pay premium prices to get products and services that connect with them, things that are meaningful to them. And people want to make connections with the folks they do business with. So having that empathy for your customer and having it come through the product is just a good business decision. And how can it help your organization? This is a really important one because you probably all know this, companies have become quite disconnected from their customers. And they use figures like, you know, 62% of urban mothers have positive impressions of the brand, yay, but they're not really uncovering the deeper, deeper ideas there, the deeper sentiments. What's also interesting is that you've seen that organizations might be changing, but they're changing from a type of organization that has not been around for a very long time. Before the Industrial Revolution, business was all about personal relationships. And I've seen here in India that it still is in a lot of ways. The service culture is really still alive and fresh and well in, in, in Bangalore and in India. So I think that's fantastic. Don't lose that. Because <laughs> it's, it's about how we really connect as people. And you don't want to get to a place where it's, you're too disconnected. Um, and your customers will act differently towards you if they see you as real people, not as just a company. So caring about them helps them see you as real people. And start to leverage how human beings are biologically wired because, as I said earlier, our brains work in a certain way. That's just how we work. So help people gain empathy. Help them make connections with other people and see how that's going to improve <coughs> their experience because if people are engaged, their productivity skyrockets. So just get them engaged. And the best innovation comes from the heart and not the head. Um, so I did want to tell a story. I don't know how much time I've got left, if any. Five minutes? I can't be quick. I'll tell this story really quickly. But So that guy, Gary Hamill, was talking about a story. Uh, he wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review a few months ago about his brother, who's a CEO at a hospital. When, the, when he arrived at the hospital, new CEO, also a doctor, he discovered that their satisfaction scores were in like the 25 percentile. And then he looked at all of the other ratings, you know, uh, uh, how people liked the food, how people thought um, the service was. And that was on par with all the other uh, hospitals in the region. But for some reason, their satisfaction scores were like so low. So he didn't know why. So he took all his employees away to an off-site and decided that he was going to make them learn how to be more loving and to make them know that they're not only caring well for people, but they're showing people how much they care about them. So he took everyone away and he told them, 
that over the next three months, he would make sure that they gave him examples of how much they're helping and how much they're caring. So he, he tracked around the, the, basically all the hospital floors and would constantly ask people, what impact have you had on, your, on the patients today? And has anyone, you know, what caring act have you, have you done today? And so that changed the culture. And then one day, uh, a man came into the hospital and he, he came in with his wife and she was really, really sick, feeling awful and he didn't know what was wrong. And he discovered that she had cancer and that she actually probably wouldn't survive the night. And he was like at his wit's end. He was just angry and upset and there were security guards who were about to like call the cops and arrest him. But then a nurse saw him in this state and she went up to him and she said, would you like a hug? So she gave him a hug and he cried on her shoulder for about 20 minutes and felt better. And it's that example of caring and having empathy for people that can really change things in that organization. And I think their satisfaction scores went up as a result because they showed people how they really cared. And they, they were going from the heart. Because you have to care. You have to care for people. You have to really care for them at a deep level. So change what's valued in the organization and make empathy a priority and make everyone care. 